Welcome to Friday Q&A for another week. We're going to get back onto the schedule of the weekly Q&A videos. So if you have questions for next week's video, please put them in the comments below, whether it is a question about guitar gear, whether it's a question about music, or if it's just some other part of my personal life you're dying to know something about, please let me know in the comments. Until then, let's get straight into the video. I posted a video about a week ago, maybe two weeks ago now, of a Ragdoll live show at Cherry Bar in Melbourne, and I got a few messages from people asking about the live rig I was using. I can understand because on stage there was a backline full stack, and you can't really see what's at my feet. Furthermore, I'm using the Stompbox Buddies from the Home Musician, which are pedal toppers that are 3D printed. Uh, if you got big dumb feet like me, I would highly recommend them. You can go to thehomemusician.com and grab those. There's my plug for the week. They are really, really great since putting them on my AX8. Um, like I said, because I'm often, you know, chucking my big dumb feet around and I'm jumping around, it does make actually nailing, stepping on that scene change that I need for a solo a whole lot easier. So I've got those on there. So my AX8 doesn't really look like the typical AX8 at the moment, but yeah, it was AX8 direct to front of house. I have posted that preset. It is my AX8 Ubershall preset, I think in December. Right before we did the living color support, I put that patch together and put it up online. So you can go and get that one, as well as the custom cab IR that I made for it. And yeah, it's all really, really simple. One thing that I did do at that gig was I also used Output 2 to record my DI guitar signal. That was because I wanted to take a desk mix of the gig. And in case anything happened, you know, on the mic cable or whatever was going on, uh, if there was some kind of disaster that can happen at live shows, then it would mean if I wanted to use the live recording and that channel was dirty or something, I could go back and reamp it later. Luckily, I didn't have to do that. So what you're hearing on that clip is the AX8 direct to front of house, which I think sounds pretty slamming. Another question that I got messaged quite a bit, I guess because it's not really a video specific question. And I did get asked this quite a few times while I was in the States uh, from some of you guys that I met and some other people who were wondering about video stuff, what video rig I'm using. At the moment, I'm shooting all of this on a Canon EOS M50, which is a mirrorless camera that takes their custom EF size lenses, which are a little bit smaller. They've got a different diameter to the classic Canon lenses. However, you can get a lens converter, which will let you use different lenses. At the moment, I'm using their 50 millimeter lens, the so-called Nifty 50, which just looks fantastic on video, I think. But most of the time, I just use the 15 to 45 millimeter kit lens that the camera came with. It's got a nice little zoom on it, and it makes a really great grab and go rig for when I want to record stuff while I'm on the road or if I'm in the studio. So that's super cool. Uh, a really big part of it though, are the softbox lights that I've got set up. Uh, you know, being able to capture good video is all about having information and video information all has to do with lighting. So honestly, if you've already got like a HD camera or even if you've got a modern smartphone, like something like the Samsung you know, Galaxy, even S7, S8, S9, or anything from like the iPhone 7 onwards, if you get some good lights, you can probably take some great video. Most of the time, uh, if I'm just recording my voice, I've got a little Rode mini shotgun mic that I use that I find just sounds a little bit better than the stock built-in tiny microphone in the M50, but when you're listening to clips of me playing guitar, you're either hearing the Axe FX3 Direct, or you're hearing an amplifier that has been mic'd. This is a super cool question. I can't remember who asked it, but I definitely remember the question being asked. It's, what would you recommend as the best amp based rig for under two grand? So I'm gonna take this to mean which amp head less than two grand would I recommend buying? And uh, I'm gonna stretch this question out and assume it's in American dollars, obviously. That would translate to a very different price here in Australia. That's probably something closer to three grand Australian and whatever that is in euros. But my instant reaction to that is, it all depends on the style of music that you're looking to play. And that is gonna be the big deciding factor. I would say if you're just doing rock shows and you were an amp head that is pretty much gonna sound good everywhere for a lot of different styles, go and get a secondhand Marshall DSL 50. It's not absolutely gonna blow your face off and be too loud, but it has plenty of power. 
The green channel is great for everything from cleans. I've recorded a lot of clean stuff with that amplifier all the way through to sort of ACDC style crunch. So if you were doing stuff where you needed, you know, kind of like 70s and 60s rock sounds, that green channel would absolutely nail that classic Marshall vibe. And then the red channel, if you boost it with something like a tube screamer, it can do stuff all the way up to metal. So I gigged with that amp for years and years. Uh, if I wasn't using an Axe FX, I would still be using that amp because I love the way it sounded live. And it was very consistent from room to room. And it wasn't fussy about the type of cabinet that you plug it into. If you were strictly a metal guy, I would say just go out and get either an old two channel rectifier and a tube screamer and boost it. Uh, that was my preferred rig for Ragdoll for a few years. Again, up until I got the Axe FX. I was actually using a DSL and a Recto uh, in a like dual mono kind of rig uh, for a few gigs before then and that was a lot of stuff to carry around. Uh, so I was using the Ragdoll for the original stuff and then anytime I had a cover gig I'd use the DSL. Back on track, uh, or a 5150 or 6505. Uh, my touring rig in the States was a 6505 combo and I think they're really really good value for money. The clean sound isn't the greatest thing you're ever going to hear in your life, but the crunchy sounds are absolutely gorgeous. So that's if you're a rock or a metal player. I would also recommend if you need a smaller solution, go and check out the Cherrytone Son of Yeti. That is one of the best sounding modified martial amps I've ever heard in my life. And you can watch my clips and reviews of that thing. Uh, Cherrytone actually would be a great choice for just about any app you want, uh, especially if you're in Australia because they're based in Malaysia, so shipping fees are a lot lower. I understand that would be a bit higher in the States. If you were somebody who basically needs a do-it-all everything amp though, uh, you know, something that can do really tight metal tones, something that can do amazing cleans, I think it would be hard to go past the Mesa Mark V 35 just because, you know, Mark series amps are amazing. They are a lot trickier to dial in and you really need to know what's going on with those. But uh, when I've heard them dialed in, I basically have never heard a better sounding uh, amp for really, really clean stuff to really brutal stuff to everything in between. And the fact you've got a graphic EQ in there, if you didn't want to use pedals, that thing would give you all the tones. If you were doing like blue stuff, or indie stuff, or anything where you need a pedal platform, I think my go-to would always just be a Fender Hot Rod Deluxe. They're kind of like the cleaner equivalent of the DSL. I think if you're a rock player and you need an amp with some grit and some attitude, the DSL is the way to go, but if you need a clean pedal platform, uh, the Hot Rod Deluxe just works. I've also done a bunch of gigs. This is going way, way back now, uh, where I used that amp with two tube screamers, and um, you know, one tube screamer would give me a little bit more grit, and the other one on top was for solos, and that was a really, really fun rig. And all of those things come in under $2,000 US. So yeah, there's a bunch of different options. Uh, like I said, if you're a Marshall guy, just get an old DSL. If you're a Mesa guy, get an old Recto or get a Mark V 35 that would come in under budget or go and check out the Cherrytone stuff because they can basically build you any amp you like. If you've seen uh, the Plagueside Studios video of his custom Cherrytone, that thing has really kicked up the gas levels for me. That sounded incredible. Some of my favorite cabinets, I'm going to assume you're talking about real world cabinets here and not impulse responses, but uh, all of this is going to carry over to the world of impulse responses because I've made impulses of all of my favorite cabinets. The cab that I probably gigged with the most is a Marshall 4x12 1960A, just the stock standard with uh, the G12 T75 speakers in it. That and a DSL was my rig like forever uh, and I've still got that cab but what I have done with it is I have swapped out some of the speakers there's now one G12 T75 there's one vintage 30 there is one WGS Reaper and there's one WGS Green Beret so essentially it's like having a G12 H30 a Greenback a V30 and the G12 T75 in one cab. The reason I did that is so that if I want to test out a head and I want to put it under the microscope with a microphone, I've got four options to close mic in the one cabinet. And I think it sounds kind of cool. It's got a very unique kind of character to it now. So that is probably my favorite cabinet that I own. I've also got a Mesa 2x12 cab that I use a lot now uh, when yeah, basically anytime I want to record an app or if I'm out gigging and I don't want to take a 412. I never want to take a 412, so I take that 212, and that's got a Vintage 30 and a G12 T75. That's actually the Mesa 
compact Recto 212 and yeah, it's a really good sounding cabinet. I've also got a Marshall 412, uh, one of the tall vintage cabs and that has a really, really cool character. If you've seen uh, my video with the Marshall Vintage Modern, I use that cabinet and basically anytime I want a classic Marshall tone with greenbacks or I want a cleaner kind of sound, I will use that cab and for me, they just cover everything that I need. The main cab that I've recorded with though is a Marshall 4x12 1960 BV, so the straight cab with the vintage 30 speakers that belongs to my buddy Troy and that is on all the Ragdoll records and it's going to be on the next Ragdoll album but I'm not using the physical cabinet, I captured some IRs of it and basically took the mic mix that we use which is a 57, a 121 and a 421 and we just shot an impulse of that and that is my main cab in my Axis X3. I use that to gig with and I use it to record with. So that cabinet kind of lives on uh, on all the ragdoll stuff which I think is pretty cool. If you look me up on axchange.com uh, under the name 2112, I know Rush Nerd, I think I made that account 10 years ago. But uh, nevertheless, you can find all of these cabinets on there in IR form. This is an AxeFX specific question. Can you run a tube preamp like a JMP1 or a Triaxis into the AxeFX and bypass the preamp and just use the power amp simulation? This question has come up a little bit. It's been something that people have asked for on the forum for quite a long time is a dedicated power amp simulator. Now there isn't a power amp block in there, but you can create one by basically Choosing your favorite amp, say like the Brit 800 model, an EL34 power section, and you go to the power amp section in there, take note of all the parameters in there. Go to the speaker section, take note of all the parameters for like speaker low resonant frequency and the speaker Q and all those kind of things. Basically go through any power amp specific or speaker specific parameter, note it down, and then go to the tube pre block and enter all of those values into the tube pre. And essentially what you can do is create a power amp in there. It's like one of the hidden features of the AxeFX 3. I'm gonna post a link to a block that I made and a preset that I made. I actually might just upload the preset to AxeChange and link you guys to it uh, of essentially an EL34 based power amp that I think sounds really good. This is something that I need to get around to doing a video on because I think a lot of you guys out there who love racks like me and have a bunch of old rack preamps would find this very, very useful. All right, talking about silver chair, if you were an Australian growing up in the late 90s, early 2000s when I was, uh, silver chair and Daniel Johns were absolutely everywhere. The album that was just like bigger than God at the time was Diorama. Uh, unfortunately, I kind of missed all of that. Like I wasn't really into rock music at the time. And then when I got into rock music, I was into stuff like Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin. I was that weird kid listening to all of my dad's music when I was in high school. But Silverchair were just everywhere. The fact that they released their first album, Frog Stomp, when they were like 13 or 14, and the fact that they could even just play in time, let alone write songs that, you know, what is that, like 25 years later now that people are still going on about and people are still playing in cover bands here, I think is pretty amazing. I mean, when you listen to Frog Stomp, uh, it's pretty clear they're just, they're on that Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden kick. That's what was huge at the time. Uh, they obviously love that music. And, you know, when you're 13, 14, it's very, very easy to wear your influences on your sleeve. But Diorama was the album that when it hit was just absolutely everywhere. I probably remember it more for the song uh, The Greatest View because that da -da 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 was on like every sporting event. I didn't even know it was them. Uh, I didn't connect the dots. And I would want to say maybe 2011, I really got into Diorama. I was driving back uh, from this country. It was like an eight hour drive and I was driving with our drummer Cam and he was DJing basically and he put Diorama on. He's like, oh man, I haven't listened to this album you know, since I was like 14 or 15 and uh, put it on and I was like, all right, cool. You know, we get to check it out. And I was blown away by it. The production on it, the writing, the string writing on there as well really, really blew me away. So I went through maybe like a six month patch where I probably listened to that album every day. So it was very, very late to the party. I think Diorama's easily the best thing they've ever done. That stacks up against just about anything. And you know, kudos to a band who can write a song called Tuner in the Brine. 
The PRS MT-15, is it a recto killer? I did get a chance to try one at the Boston Guitar Show. I will go straight out and say it is not a recto killer because a 100 watt dual rectifier is not gonna get killed by anything. That amp is like the equivalent of the mountain from Game of Thrones, you know, even when you think that thing's been beaten, uh, it hasn't really, it's, it's gonna come back and it's gonna absolutely crush you. So it's not a recto killer, but for a 15 watt lunchbox head, I was amazed at how tight the low end was and how punchy it sounded. I thought the gain sounds were really, really good and really usable. There was plenty of mid-range in there, not like a kind of honky, annoying mid-range though, like girth. That's what I liked about it. Uh, but the thing that really surprised me were the clean sounds. I loved the clean sounds on it and uh, I used to own an Orange Dart Terror and that's a great filthy sounding amp, but it didn't have a dedicated clean channel. Whereas I think if I had my time again, I would uh, go with an MT-15 if I needed a small, uh, you know, grab and go lunchbox head. The only other thing, uh, I know I mentioned Cherry Tone earlier, that sort of comes close for gain tones is the Son of Yeti. I probably like the Son of Yeti gainy tones a little bit better, but the MT-15 clean channel was pretty awesome. And last but certainly not least, my thoughts on the Fractal FM3, as well as some very specific questions about the FM3. I did go to Axfest and I did get to play the FM3. I got some time after hours with it uh, to basically noodle around and make a preset. Uh, but to be honest, I didn't spend a whole lot of time playing it, it was obviously why a lot of people went down to that to check it out. So, uh, you know, it was like one of those things, it's like the popular ride at the amusement park, everybody wanted to have a go. Uh, and I spent a lot of my time at AxeFest just chatting to people who either were on the forum, who came down to hang out and uh, meeting a bunch of you guys from YouTube and talking to people about their rigs and yeah, basically just hanging out and having a good time. And I also did a clinic there, so part of it was prepping for that. So I didn't actually get a whole lot of time with the FM3, but uh, there's been a lot of questions like, for example, can you run two separate signal chains through it? Well, essentially the FM3 is using the same architecture as the AxeFX 3. So you've got separate input and output blocks. To, so that is definitely possible to say, run your acoustic guitar through input and output two with a compressor and an EQ, and then run your elect electric guitar with like an amp and a cabinet and reverb and delay. So that's pretty cool. Uh, the other thing that a lot of people have been asking is like, does it have the pitch block? Does it have the drive block? Does it have the long reverbs and things like that? Uh, most of the effects from the AxeFX 3 are in the FM3. However, there are often fewer instances of them. For example, in the AxeFX3, you can run up to four separate delay blocks and each delay block has four channels. In the FM3, there's two instances of that block, but each block still has four channels, which is pretty awesome. And, you know, a lot of you are thinking about making, you know, big rigs where you can go from clean to mean. You can either use the channels feature in there or you can use the scene controllers in there. So they're in there, the cloud reverbs are in there, uh, the multi-delay is in there, which is really important for me because I absolutely love that block. The pitch block is in there. Uh, it was pretty funny actually, uh, they didn't have the chorus block working uh, because they had one unit, there's one FM3 uh, kicking around there and it's still in the beta phase, so they're still porting over a lot of the code from the AxeFX 3 in there. So there are a few blocks which hadn't been added yet, or if they were in there, they weren't working 100%. So I think that's one of the cool things though about something like AxeFX, you know, like a AxeFX, AxeFX, uh, you know, Fractal's actually going out to their users and letting them test things in the development phase and getting feedback from them, which ultimately is gonna make a better product when it comes out onto the market for sales. So yeah, also the thing with the foot switches, you can use the new stand-in switches feature, which is gonna mean, for example, if you want to have scene one, two, three on your buttons, but then you want it to be able to switch between layouts, or you want it to have tap hold for like tap tempo and a tuner, you can assign those to external switches while also still running your expression pedals. So yeah, it's gonna be very interesting to actually see what the feature set is when it comes out. But most of the cool stuff that people want from the AxeFX 3 is gonna be in there. And it's got a headphone jack and it's got USB recording. So uh, I've said it before, I've, I'll say it again as well. It's gonna make a lot of people happy. It's not necessarily an upgrade from the AX8. It's more of like a new tier in Fractal's modeling. So yeah, I mean, it sounds great. That's the most important thing. If you're like me and 95% of the time you go like, you know, Mark II C plus cabinet, 
I uh, of you know one of my cabs that I was talking about earlier that I can bump in and then multi delay, maybe a bit of EQ, maybe a multi band compressor and a wah. I can go and just play guitar for hours with that kind of rig, which is uh, ultimately what it's all about. Thank you guys so much if you've watched this far. The last little thing I want to add are three musical selections. One that I would start with is go and check out the incredible Andy Wood. I watched his clinic at AxeFest and it's one of the best things I've ever seen and I've been listening to his solo albums. Uh, definitely go and check out Junktown. I think that is one of the tastiest instrumental guitar things I've heard in quite a long time and uh, I can't remember if it's off that album or off another one but the song uh, called A Lie that is just <clears throat> he played that and I was like man this is this is like Eric Johnson and John Sykes and Jerry Reed had a baby you know uh, it's pretty awesome another guy who played at AxeFest was Immune uh, Zach Munowitz He's like 20 years old. It's all self-produced, self-recorded. He's an incredible singer. He's a really great guitar player. His production is top-notch. It's kind of like if you took Periphery and slammed it together with like EDM beats. Uh, it's really, really fresh stuff. And he is such a lovely dude. I got to hang out with Zach a lot that weekend. Um, he's just somebody who really, really loves music. And you know, once you've kind of been around the traps, uh, for a little while. I'm only 30, but I've been playing professionally for nearly 10 years. It's really easy to get cynical about music, and being around somebody like that is a breath of fresh air. So lovely dude, and you can go and check out his EP on all the usual platforms. And if you're feeling in the mood to support the channel, you can go and listen to my 45-minute ambient track, shameless self-plug on here, on Spotify and iTunes and all that kind of stuff. It's called Epoch. Uh, it's something that I recorded, uh, I want to say maybe about two years ago and sat around and essentially about two years ago it was uh, one of those phases where like all my best friends moved to different countries and uh, we had this sort of like big going away thing and uh, I came home and I was just in one of those reflective moods and uh, yeah this track came out so if you uh, just want to like bliss out for 45 minutes and put headphones on and close your eyes and have a good time, you can go and check out that track. So there's a shameless self plug uh, for the week. Thank you guys so much for watching all of the video. I will see you next time.